Imagine the Rio Grande. It travels a course from the Rocky Mountain headwaters down to the Gulf of Mexico, nourishing farms and cities on its way, as well as providing essential habitat for wildlife. Each year, USGS stream gauge sensors monitor river flow, collecting a massive body of numeric data. Now, imagine gauge stations transformed into human singers, and the song they sing reveals the truth about the impact of human manipulation and climate change on our river. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics, working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're joined by the artists behind There Must Be Other Names for the River, Dylan McLaughlin, Marisa DeMarco, and Jessica Zeglin. This online art installation, hosted by the University of New Mexico Art Museum, guides visitors along the length of the Rio Grande, where they hear the songs of singers emerging from points along its 1,800-mile length. Thank you all so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Can we just start out by talking a little bit about why you all decided to create a song based on river data? Dylan, Jessica, and I were in class together that was held by Nina Elder, who's an artist. And the concept that we were thinking into was deep time, which can be interpreted so many different ways. But one way is to think about the far distant past or the far distant future, right? And through that conversation, the idea of the age of the river had come up. It started forming maybe five million years ago and kind of got into the shape that it is today about one million years ago. And I had seen some really alarming dry areas of the river and through my work as a journalist had gone out with reporter Laura Paskus to talk about that, to talk about how the river is this really old entity. And then if you think about it, like in just the last 50 years or so, the impacts of climate change have really radically changed it. And so if you're thinking about that timeline, the river is changed really in the blink of an eye compared to its own age, right? And so that was kind of something that had come up in our meetings and gatherings in the class. But why a song? What made you all say, hey, you know, music is the best way to help people understand what this time looks like on the river? In addition to being a news reporter, I'm a musician as well and do a lot of experimental music and composition and performance. And I know Dylan works in sound too, and so does Jessica. And so you're thinking about how do you interpret these things sonically. And I really think music can emote and transform a space in a way that is different than just delivering the narrative kind of in the way that we're doing right now, right? Like the way that I'm speaking right now to explain this piece and what we're talking about is not going to shift people in a visceral way in the same way that that music does. And I think that was a real driver behind the idea of converting the data into a score. So for the sake of our listeners, I think this is a good time to play a brief excerpt of the audio from the project. And then after that, maybe one of you could describe the project and sort of draw a more complete picture of what it is exactly that we're talking about. So here we go. Here's an excerpt from Other Names for the River. Could one of you sort of explain the project itself? I've been to the website to take a look, but we're talking about singing data. So draw a picture for our listeners. Well, the three of us are artists and maybe obviously working at the intersections of science and ecological research, storytelling, performance, improvisational music, experimental new music, illustration. I mean, all these mediums, I think, that we kind of intersect in as artists and in this prompt that was, how would the three of us engage in a conversation around deep time? 
And as we are situated here at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, thinking a lot about what are the lifelines and the sources of deep time that surround us. And so we kind of very easily and naturally gravitated towards conversations around the Rio Grande for maybe different personal reasons, but with some maybe obvious unifying reasons, which are conversations around, we're so tied to this as a life source in all the conversations and complexities that come out of that idea in itself. And so what the three of us did was we designed initially a music composition that was based on what might happen if we took essentially 50 years worth of historic streamflow data from the Rio Grande and gave that to a group of improvisers, a group of vocalists to translate that data into song. And what might that experience look like? So it's a set of prompts. It's a set of kind of simple questions like, let's try this and see what happens. We designed actually a performance, which we did at the University of New Mexico Art Museum with our original six musicians that we workshopped this kind of experimental score with, whom then kind of set in motion this idea of sonically embodying the sort of lineage, the last 50 years of this river. But then with that additional music score prompt of the last 15 minutes of the performance, sort of imagining the next 2000 years of the lifespan of the Rio Grande. And so thinking about coming from a place of having spent the last 30 minutes embodying historic data, historic drought, historic flow, rise and fall of the Rio then spend the next 15 minutes projecting in what are possible futures. And that in itself felt like kind of a radical act because we don't spend a lot of time thinking 2000 years into the future. And so here we are in the context of a music piece, asking our singers to do this. And we and the audience then really get to be part of that experience. And so that's kind of where the project initially started was through a set of these music performances. And we did two of them, the first at the UNM Art Museum and the second at the National Hispanic Cultural Center as part of an exhibition organized with 516 Arts titled Species in Peril. So we showed as part of that exhibition kind of a composite graphic score for this piece. And we also did a music performance at the National Hispanic Cultural Center that fall. And so we were then invited through the vision of the staff at the UNM Art Museum to imagine a physical installation version of this music performance. And so then we were prompted, what would this project look like spatially? What would it look like as a sound installation, as a physical space that the audience is invited to come in and traverse? We spent kind of a few months really designing a lot of considerations around what would this space be that we're designing, that people would be welcomed into, that people could kind of experience the complexity around all these conversations. And we really very intentionally and methodically and intuitively designed this experience that people would physically traverse. And then all of a sudden we're in a global pandemic. And the conversation about traversing physical museum spaces or galleries becomes a very different conversation. Museums left and right are closing all across the world. And so that's where we then shifted into, okay, well, maybe what makes the most sense is let's move online. We'll do a web-based version of this same experience, but now we're doing a virtual version of that. So there are all these interesting prompts that kind of set us up for reconfiguring the project as it stands now. So when I went to the website and was able to play with the map of the river and the points along the river that you drew data from, and then there were buttons for turning on and off these vocal tracks. So that version is like version 3.0. Is that kind of what I'm understanding? Because you had a physical sound installation that never quite materialized because you designed it, but didn't get to install it because of the pandemic. Yeah, that's right. We've had to think and rethink through this piece quite a few times. When Jessica, Dylan, and I started working together, we didn't know we were going to do this for two years. Um, <laughs> but I would say that something that is retained throughout it is that when it's performed live, the singers, we have them stand in the shape of the river. The idea for the live performance was that you could kind of hear the water moving from year to year. And it's really interesting because you have to listen very closely to what the person upstream of you is doing, right? As well as to the whole piece. And so we were gonna preserve that kind of physical spatial element for the installation in the third floor of the UNM Art Museum. But I think the online exhibit kind of preserved that. And that's why you can do that on the website. When you go to othernamesforthereverend.com, that's why you can kind of choose to hear someone individually if you have a connection to a certain point along the river, but you can also traverse the river. And um, that was something we were trying to keep as you're scrolling through the page, different singers are emerging. 
Just a detail thing. I want to just circle back to something that Dylan said. So you took the data and used that as kind of a prompt for the singers. What does that look like, what you handed them? Because you didn't hand them like a spreadsheet of data. Not a spreadsheet. You can actually download this score at the site. You can see exactly what it looks like. It has instructions for how to respond to the visual representation of the river flow data. It is also reliant on the performer's explorations and interpretations of that, which brings their personal relationship with the river into the piece, which is always true in performance, but this very explicitly requests that. And uh, Jessica can talk about the like number crunching. This is like a several days long math endeavor that Jessica did a lot of the work on and also did tons of the research that you're seeing pop up on the website as you explore the river line. When you look at the visual score itself, right, what you'll see is kind of a wiggly up and down line that looks a little bit like a landscape of mountains or something like that. That's the actual flow of water through the river month by month. And then you'll also see these uh, circles that change size over time. And each of those circles represents the average flow in the river over that year. So there's a couple of different forms of graphic representation of the data that are occurring at the same time. And so the artists can then look at those representations and combine that with their personal experiences of the river and their expressions as singers and using this visual framework, along with some basic score instructions that we give them, they then interpret that through their bodies, right? There's a question I think that Ellen asked a little bit earlier about why was it a song? And I think we came to this piece all working in sound in different ways already, so it felt very intuitive to us to have it be this visceral musical experience. But I think it did take us a little bit of feeling out to realize that we wanted it to be a vocal piece and that we wanted it to be sung because of the physical relationship that we all have living with the Rio Grande and through it, literally taking the water into our bodies. So this channeling that the singers do is both a metaphorical poetic channeling and a literal one. And then also I think we wanted this score to be a framework not just for professional singers, but for anybody. So having it be a sung piece hopefully makes it more accessible. I think at one point we were joking about, like, we should make it all trombones. I don't know. (laughs) What if it's violins? But this makes it so you don't need a special instrument. You don't need special equipment. You can just go to the website, read it, and interpret it in any way through your own body that feels right for you. And so we hope lots of folks will do that. I was curious how you picked the six gauge stations out of many and how you decided that a year's worth of stream flow data was the best unit for a musical measure. That's a great question. So I'll get nerdy, I guess. I love getting nerdy. There are quite a few gauge stations all along the river and along its tributaries. And I think one of the interesting aspects of that is that those gauge stations are there both for ecological monitoring, but also because of the many legal constructs that happen around the river and around the water in the river. It's very much counted and enumerated and managed. But I think that we chose the ones that we did because we wanted the singers to be able to give you this holistic experience of the river. We wanted to hear the headwaters and the mouth of the river as it sometimes reaches the ocean and every part in between. So choosing each of those gauge stations gave us access to a representation of the physicality of the river, but consolidated. One of the considerations was that at some of these gauge stations, the data goes back to like the late 1800s, the information is old, but not all of it. And so we wanted to start at a point that is kind of right before you can feel the real impacts of climate change and then carry us through present day. And then from there, determine the length of the piece. And in some places, the data is missing, right? So from the past into the present day, there's points where the data starts getting managed by the International Boundary Commission, and then it's not public, or where some information is just not there. So there was like days of research of looking and being like, what points has consistent data that we can use? Yeah, the data are collected and maintained by different bureaucratic organizations, and that has shifted over time. So that was another consideration is what data can we access, what data are publicly available, and how can we present that as a record that people can interact with and understand. It's a remarkable piece and effort. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. I wanted to ask you about the role of grief in your piece, because I know personally my experience was it took me four tries to get past the 90s, because as soon as the voices start dropping out, you can feel that river drying up. But the thing that really hit me was realizing that you all had been doing this over this arc of the pandemic and that you've had your own personal losses as a part of this project. Would you all mind talking a little bit about the emotional roller coaster of working with this material and visualizing into the future and working in a time of great loss? I think that a lot of people have a really emotional reaction to the piece when it's performed live. We heard from a lot of folks after the performances who said that they would see the years and they would think, oh, that's when my children were born, or that's when my grandfather died, or that's when I moved to New Mexico. Like Because the years are displayed on the wall as we move through the piece, you can see each year and note the ones that have relationship with you, which I think further strengthens that time and place memory, right? And that's great. Like I love that the piece is drawing that for people, like making the really personal connection. And I would say that the piece for me starts in kind of a grief about the river itself. I've always lived next to this river. I've always lived in Albuquerque. I've been in the river and on the river, like most of my 40 years on this planet, right? And so the day that so much riverbed was just dry and had plants in it because it hadn't been wet in a long time, right? Like you see the plants start to grow up where they're supposed to be water. It really was like a sudden grief, right? And you're right that in the pandemic, a lot of people are going to the river to celebrate sometimes or to just be outside or to run or just get out of their house. But I think we also are going there to process other things that we're going through. I personally have been down there a lot to process grief so it starts to hold these other emotional resonances and I bet more people than just me are down at the river doing that work and I think the other kind of nice thing about it though is that when we had to make this piece virtual is we were thinking about how the river is connective in the sense that even if we're not able to see each other it's connecting us to our neighbors who are up and downstream from us all the time the river for me feels like the through line it's a thing that is nourishing us all who live along its stretch Dylan, you have that video up with an interview with Laura Paskus talking about what's going on with the river environmentally that also has that really powerful drone video of the dry riverbed along so much of its length. Yeah, so the video that you can find on our About page on othernamesfortheriver.com is a piece that we all collectively decided that we wanted to include as kind of part of the conversation. There's a few things that inform the question you just asked. One is that credit is absolutely due to Kevin Maestas, who gathered that drone footage. The journalism and sort of conversations. Laura Paskus is an environmental news journalist who's been generating and adding to and exploring these conversations specifically around the Rio Grande for a while now. And so a lot of the framework of this piece itself is kind of really based in the news journalism of Laura Paskus. But the conversation itself that we had with Laura Paskus, it's like the reason we sort of frame this as a conversation on the riverbed there, as we did, as we see in the video, is that it's such a complex unraveling of a story. And there's so many different access points to how we can connect with this project in itself, to the issues themselves, to the different places themselves. There's so many physical access points. It's like the conversation is so dynamic that some of what we're talking about goes very deep for a lot of people. People are very familiar with like, oh, I know that water. I've swam in that water. I've eaten out of that water. And some people are like, oh, I hardly ever see it. Uh, I see it in passing over the bridges, yet I live right next to it. It's like we can't simplify those conversations. It's so wildly complex. And so that video piece that you're asking about just sort of emerged from let's provide an additional connecting element to that. And I want to jump in too on the issue of grief because I've been trying to reflect on this question of what is the role of grief in this particular piece or in any sort of artwork where we're talking about climate change or systemic racism or all of these 
sometimes seemingly huge issues that we're bearing the brunt of every day. And I think the word complex is really relevant because some people might have a more visceral experience of the river in their everyday life than others. I think one of the strengths of this piece is that it does make that visceral connection through sound between our own bodies and the body of the river. And the sense of grief really comes from a sense of love, right? You only feel grief for something that you treasure and that you feel you have a relationship to. And I think we want to highlight and hopefully deepen that relationship through this piece. But speaking just for me at the same time, I don't want people to feel immobilized by that grief. I want you to be able to feel the importance of this entity, but for that grief to also transform into a sense of urgency and a sense of hope and possibility. When you start to move into the possible futures, you can imagine a future where the river dries up entirely, or you can imagine all kinds of other futures where maybe we let the river flood again, maybe it stops being an international border, maybe we create different agricultural systems to interact with it differently. So I think along with that grief, we also have to have this hope and this imagination. And I hope that folks experience all of that through this piece. Jessica, someone described to me recently that grief is love with nowhere to go. And that at the time really struck me as being accurate because it is love. Grief is love still. But I think as we think of this piece, yeah, we want to know, we want to observe and bear witness to a loss. But then how do you also shift that into directing your love, basically? How do you take the grief and the love and channel it into work to save or to fix or replenish something that is feeding us all? I think especially with something that happens essentially in a kind of slow motion, you know, like we were talking about in the first segment. These changes don't happen in one day, like some kinds of changes that we experience. It's stuff that's happening over time, like you were saying, Marisa. You've watched these changes happen in slow motion over your entire life, which is also my way of kind of coming back to deep time. You used that phrase in our first segment. Could you sort of maybe expand on that a little bit? Like when you say deep time, what does that mean for you as a group or for each of you in terms of this project? I feel like it's a phrase I should have heard before, but I haven't. Oh, that's a good question. I think it probably means different things to different people, right? And so I'll also leave time for other folks to respond. But I think for me, deep time is considering the layers of time that we exist within. There is the present moment in which we're operating right now, but there are all of the histories that this land contains and that the people who live on this land live out every day and that the river contains. And as Marisa was describing in the first segment, the river started forming five million years ago, right? It became something like what it is maybe one million years ago. And trying to conceive of that and kind of place yourself within this larger realm of time how have we interacted with this landscape over these millennia? Then how can we interact into the future? I think deep time is Nina Elder's concept for the work she was doing at the University of New Mexico with all different kinds of classes. It's kind of a big enough framework that it could encapsulate lots of different thoughts about time and experience, right? One way that I was thinking about it, which is relevant to this moment, is time stretching. In the pandemic, we are losing time. I don't mean that we're like running out of time or something, but we're like losing track of time in this new way where the days Monday through Friday don't have the same meaning. Like the work week doesn't have the same meaning. Staying up late or getting up early, everything is different for us all with time. So that's one of the wildest things about the pandemic. And then working on this piece for two years is it's like, yeah, it was two years, but I don't even know what two years is anymore. Sometimes I think of something, it feels like it happened a really long time ago and it was like yesterday, but yesterday feels really far away from me right now. There's just a lot of different ways to think about time and time stretching. And then I think what it means to think into the future, especially as we're thinking ecologically and environmentally, like 
if you consider 50 years inside of a million years, which is the river's lifespan, this is a very sudden injury, even though it unfolded very slowly for me because my experience of time is as a little human. So 50 years feels like a long time for me. But if you're thinking about it from the quote unquote perspective of the river, 50 years is like a sudden wound or a sudden harm. It's not long. Also, we found that researchers don't project the future for this river out more than a couple hundred years, not because they're anticipating it will end, but that's just as far as they've gone. Just listening to the colleagues and collaborators here, Marisa and Jessica, it's kind of constantly illustrating just how we all connect to this work from very similar and very diverse points of view. I think that in itself is also kind of the simple prompt to this whole work. It's storytelling, it's connective, it's about processing, it's about, you know, reconnecting and re-exploring and connecting to other perspectives and scales of time. I mean, at one point you had asked, why have the music piece itself moved through annually? Why every year like that? On one level, it seems a little bit obvious. Well, it's like, that's how we've kind of mapped and framed time, you know, year by year. But maybe a little bit more of a deeper conceptual meaning of that is because of the possibilities for a connection that can take place when we provide all that opportunity. Even just the visual language of seeing those dates and being able to connect with it with our own material, our own stories, our own celebrations, our own grieving, our own trauma, our own healing, our own birth births, our own deaths. That's one of the ways that we all kind of share our experience of time. It's loaded. That's what some of those references are for us in this piece that are kind of quite simply us being like, well, these are some containers where a lot of complexity can happen. You know, improvisation is a container where a lot of complexity can happen. Experimental graphic scores are containers where a lot of complexity can happen. Thinking about deep time is a container (laughs) and so on. Projecting into the future is an incredible container where a lot of complexity can happen. And it's different when we're thinking about an imagined future. It's different than looking back into the past because we just don't have the same kind of references. We don't have the same kind of stories about the future. And yet maybe they're possible. And yet maybe we really could design with the future in mind. Maybe we really could tell stories with the future in mind. In some ways, it's a stretch that we're kind of saying, let's imagine 2,000 years into the future. And in other ways, it's not that of a difficult or complex thing to do. In fact, I think we could normalize it by talking about it more often. I'm not going to be an author or actor that's going to be making physical changes to the river. But there are other ways that our presence, our culture, our society, our stories really will have a big impact 2,000 years from now. And so there's some interesting openings, possibilities that can happen in that space of projected future. And it's not as abstract as it might sound. And it's not that far removed from our experiences right now as it might sound. It might feel really foreign and abstract because it kind of is, but at the same time, it's really like 2,000 years from now is going to happen. Whether we're here or not. (laughs) Whether we're here or not, it's going to happen. And so that's really interesting territory, I feel like. I think Dylan just completely nailed it. And I think it's also maybe part of why working on this piece in this time that has felt so frozen has maybe actually been really good for me as an individual and maybe also for the people who experience the piece. Because, yeah, we're frozen. We're losing time. We're out of sync things feel weird and time feels weird, but 2,000 years in the future is coming, right? And so that's maybe something to hold on to, you know? You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. We're just so excited to be talking with you all today. One of the things that I find thrilling about your online installation are the tributaries to the river. You have a score for improvisation with some real basic instructions, and then you've got a submission form so that people can contribute their tributaries, their interpretations done individually or together of your score. You know, if I were going to pick, say, the Albuquerque stream gauge data as my part, how am I supposed to interpret it? How do I do the big circles or the little circles or the circles that are sort of funky? So as a musician, what do you recommend to people? With the score, there's instructions around interpreting those moments along the river. And when the circles are disrupted, you're seeing the increasing impacts of human decision making around climate change, and then also the San Juan Chama drinking water project, which was a huge, huge moment for the river. It's another one that we identified. Of course, there's others, but those were the two that we were looking at, especially within this time frame that the square encompasses. The idea is that you modify your tone or your intensity along with those different aspects of the information. And the tributaries part has been really cool. It was something that we all wanted to do in the physical installation was to create a space within it where people could offer up their own thoughts and perspectives of their experiences of the exhibit. But also what's happened online is that they're coming in from all over the place. So it's not just from people who have visited the museum, but we're hearing from people who live at these different points along the river and who have personal, familial, or historic connections to certain points along the river. One person, Mateo Galindo, did his piece as an interpretation of some really important years for his family in the Big Bend area and that data point. So he just kind of took part of the score and, and sent that back to us. There's another contributor, Carlos Santisteban, who decided to respond as the ecosystem. So he's being the ecosystem response to the water, as opposed to being the water and being the river, he's being all the things around it, which I thought was really fascinating. And he does it with stand-up bass. There's also a poem from Leon de la Rosa Carrillo, who lives in Juarez. The poem is about a young person who was killed by Border Patrol. So it doesn't have to always be oh, read the score and then interpret this musically as a score. We try to make it open-ended enough where people can just tell us a story or give us a reflection or could go to the river and make sounds out there. Because if you participate in the full score, it takes about 25 minutes. And I'm like, not everybody wants to sit down for 25 minutes and do this, right? Some people do, but not everybody does. And so what are some other ways that we can invite more stories into the piece? And what's actually happening with these submissions? Are they then publicly available for people to check out? Yeah, on the tributaries page, people send the submissions in. I check out the audio and, you know, making sure that it's a good volume that can be heard as people go to the website. And then we upload it there. And so you can go through and check out each person's submissions and responses. Additionally, we're going to work with communities who live in these six points along the river and ask them to sing the full score and then fold that into the main exhibition. Again, thinking of the piece as connective in this time of physical distancing. Do you have a rough idea of how many submissions you've gotten? Dozens, hundreds, thousands? No, <laughs> maybe over the year it will become like that. I actually solicited some of these as kind of seed contributions to kind of give examples of what people could do and to have something there so people can check it out and maybe feel inspired by hearing other people's responses. But the site is up for at least a year and I don't know what will roll in. And it'll keep growing and changing over time. The more folks contribute, the more stories we get, the more that other people can hear those stories. And also there's a phone number you can call too. You know, if you don't want to mess with recording equipment, <laughs> we have on the tributary site, you can click a button there and it will call a Google voice number and you can record just a short, you know, like a short love letter to the river or whatever you want to say. You could almost do that with a cell phone down at the river itself or something like that. That'd be really cool. I'm going to have to download some of these scores and go try it, I think. I did notice in the directions for the score, you do recommend that people go to the river and spend time with the river. And I know we just got done talking about time, 
But I do feel like there's something in your piece that is a reminder that it's hard to experience nature in a moment. It's hard to experience nature when you're driving across the bridge. But you really include these sort of explicit instructions to take time to perceive the colors and the sounds and think about where the water's coming from and where the water's going. I guess I want to ask about the experience of being at the river and working at this piece and the experience of like being in a museum or like doing it online or sitting by yourself in your home and working on this piece. What is that element? element of place that plays into this. I want to jump in with kind of a couple of considerations that I think of from that question. The first is, well, you know, not everyone can get down to the river. We can't all experience the river the same way. And I think that's kind of also what connects us to the river. Even just the little image that you painted of driving over the bridge and experiencing the river. Honestly, I would absolutely love to hear a piece from that perspective because that would be representative of a lot of people's relationship to the river. And it's not to be discounted. I think the reality is so many people on a daily basis experience the river through perhaps the perspective of, oh yeah, it does look beautiful today. Oh, I saw some people there today or it's really low today, or it's really high today, or I wish I had the time to go and sit on the water today, but I have to go to work. That's probably one of the most common relationships to the river. And so I think there's absolutely room for that. I know that's not necessarily what you're asking, but I think what I'm trying to communicate here is there's so many ways. You don't have to go down and have the whole transcendental experience in order to participate in this project, right? Right. But if you can, if you have the ability to get yourself to the river, it's incredible what can come from that too. That's also part of the invitation. And then the score that we have used for the performances that we've done in the past with this piece one of the score instructions for our singers has been to go and take some time before the music performance itself to go down to the river and find their own way of connecting, whether that means collecting an object, telling a story, meditating on deep ancestral lineages to the Rio. You know, that's part of the consideration that we've kind of built into the music score. I don't know, a lot emerges from being able to spend time next to the river. I'm really curious thinking about making connections and that you have your singers who contributed and of course you as a group coming up with the concept and the prompts. Have you had feedback from the agencies themselves, like either from the Conservancy Districts or from USGS? Because they have a whole other perspective and connection to the river, like you were saying, Dylan, but their connection and story is very different given that it's management and water deliveries and water compacts and all right. that. And I'm just curious if... Where does the Bureau of Reclamation <laughs> weigh in on? <laughs> there must be other names for the river. I was just going to joke that we haven't received an official statement from them yet. We should send them all the website and be like, by the way, we interpreted the information that we got from you. Thanks uh, for your work. Here's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a totally unexpected trajectory for your data collection. The two things that I can think of are that we haven't reached out to any of those agencies. The data that we got is publicly available and online, so we didn't have to really contact them. But we did take all the singers down for an acapella performance of this piece. So as Dylan said, we had asked originally the six singers to visit the river the day before the performance, to borrow something from the river, and then to return it. And on that return, we went and did a acapella performance of the piece with no audience, just like the singers and we were recording. Just so happened to be some people sitting on the river beach, just hanging out with their dog. And Jessica went over as our emissary to explain what we were up to, right? Because a bunch of people are gonna stand in the river and make weird sounds for 40 minutes. And we thought we should let them know why. And uh, it turned out that they collect river flow data for a living. It was the weirdest coincidence. It was so strange. And um, they hung out and watched us do the piece because I think they were interested in seeing how the numbers got interpreted by the singers. That's one bit of connection with the actual researchers doing this work. The only other thing is that the International Boundary Commission holds a chunk of this data and all of a sudden just drops off the site. You can't see the data anymore. So I reached out to the International Boundary Commission to be like, hey, can you guys send me these years, please? And they said no. So that's the only other point of contact with the entities that collect this information that we've had. 
I filed a couple of years ago a FOIA request because it's not a state agency to try to get that information. I haven't heard back. I should have followed up, but a lot happened, like a whole pandemic and everything. And maybe now I will see if I can still get that information from them. And for the listener who might be ignorant, it's the International Boundary Commission, you said, because the river is the international border between Mexico and the United States through Texas. Yeah, it's the International Boundary Water Commission is the agency that takes over monitoring from where the river is designated as an international border. For people that haven't pulled out a map since middle school. And there's no reason why your neighbor would know that information, right? It's an interesting kind of mishmash of bureaucratic agencies that monitors the river and that regulates the river. And so one of the things that I hope folks will get out of the site is we do have some historical information about the laws and agreements that are providing this legal framework through which the river is managed. And so hopefully that gives a little bit more of an idea of like what's going on here, <laughs> because it is Byzantine. In that video that you have up with the drone footage of the Dry River, Laura Paskus talks about how there are a lot of constituencies. The farmers want one thing and the cities want one thing and the wildlife refuges want something else. But there's nobody really who is a constituent for the river. And I really feel like, to me, that's some of the power of your project, because by going back to these times before the really huge interventions, like when the headwaters are trickling down and you can hear all the voices really well, you think, well, that's what a healthy river sounds like. That's what I want the future to sound like. And sort of gives you this emotional place to know how to be a constituent for the healthy river. I do believe from meeting scientists individually or from meeting those folks on the riverbanks, I believe, or I want to believe, <laughs> that everybody involved in those different constituencies does care about the life of the river, right? But that because of the groups that we may belong to, we start to think, well, I need this water for my group for this reason. And there starts to be this idea of scarcity around the river. And I think for me in this piece, one of the threads that have come out of working on it for the past two years is thinking about how can we think of this entity not just as a resource and also not just through a lens of scarcity, but how can we think of this through a lens of abundance? where we have agricultural needs, we have drinking water needs, we have cultural needs that all relate to this river, but we also do really share this entity. We all want to share this water and how can we think of it through this lens of it can be shared. We can all manage this resource through a lens of abundance and generosity and how do we move towards that? I think that's a seriously positive note to end this segment on, if that's all right with everyone. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. I want to just start by talking a little bit about your collaboration. We were commenting how well you all work together as a group, and I guess that's bound to happen after collaborating on a project after two years. But your group was bigger. Did you have the same group of singers? You've done this three times, three performances. Is that correct? We've done two performances for the public, and it was six singers. And one of them switched out because somebody wasn't available. Those performances were pretty far apart in time, too. You're kind of relaunching the piece. And then we also did, with the original six singers, we went down to the river and recorded the piece there. 
And then as we were conceiving the physical installation for the UNM Art Museum, the idea was to form informal choirs at each of those points and to meet up with those people all the way from the headwaters to the mouth and record them singing just that point. And so we had formed the Albuquerque Choir in early 2020 and had them all come to the river and they just are singing the Albuquerque data because it was the beginning of collecting that choir audio which was going to be part of the physical installation and then of course when the pandemic happens it's no longer a good idea to go traveling to those places to meet up with big groups of people so that's kind of the trajectory the three of us are the composers and artists and organizers and conceivers of the project and we enlist the help of different singers and musicians to make it happen. Earlier we talked how you had all met in Nina Elder's art class, right? Is that how you all ran into each other? We knew each other from school. We were all graduate students in the UNM art department. And then Jessica came to me and was like, we're going to do this kind of mini class. We were hoping you would do it with me and Dylan and Nina. But we already knew each other from school. We talked about this a little bit in the first segment that you all had some audio and music background, but aside from that, on this particular project, is there a bit of a breakdown in people's particular strengths? Jessica, it seemed like you ended up being kind of the number cruncher. I think we sift tasks according to what people feel comfortable with and excited about doing. I'm comfortable with being patient, sifting through data, which I don't know if that's a skill or not, but yeah. So are there other places where one of you sort of took more of the lead in a particular aspect of the task list? All the time, all the time. Jessica did number crunching, did research, did recording, did conceptualizing of the score. Her handwriting is the font for the piece. It has the best handwriting of the three of us, we agreed. Also, as we were developing the concept of the piece, we all did that together. There's so many facets of this piece because it is a public facing piece where we're really trying to kind of say something specific and get the message out far that there's a lot of components you wouldn't normally think of in an art project, right? But I would say that artistically, it was grown from the three of us, and then we're breaking off these other component tasks. Jessica's also a great emissary. Like, if we have to explain to someone why we're going to stand around and sing for 40 minutes, I'm like, I really think Jessica should go do that. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> Jessica gets along with everyone. Yeah, Jessica is the nice <laughs> one. She totally is. <laughs> I was trying not to say that directly, Dylan, but um, yeah, you're right. I think that there's been a lot, a lot of moving parts to all of this work. And I think the interesting thing about having navigated a very successful collaboration, one is I think we all have deep backgrounds in collaborative processes in our creative work. So collaboration, I think, is not new to any of us, and we all do it and have been doing it for a long time. And I think that as far as some of the project organizational aspects, it's about delineating tasks or delegating tasks. Gosh, it's like overwhelming to think about how many things we've done, you know, like all the budgets and all the modifications of the budgets we put together, all these time schedules, composing emails that are going to UNM organizers. All that being said, the interesting thing about this collaboration is that it all goes through the three of us. And yet we're also all really constantly having utmost faith in each other. Whoever chooses out of the three of us to do the thing is doing it because they're probably the best at it or for whatever reason can get it done. And then so the other two of us would be like, thank you, you're the best at this. I don't think I could have done it because I didn't have time or because I'm going through something that's keeping me from being able to focus on this right now or because I'm teaching at the moment or because X, Y, Z. Like it's been an incredible year to be working on a massive art project like this. Making a large scale art project like this in the midst of a global pandemic has been really, really complicated, difficult, and also inspiring and grounding. We've almost met weekly for the last year. And so then how we like choose who does what just kind of comes naturally out of who can do this. Like Marisa managed, facilitated, scheduled all of the recording sessions with each of the musicians for the final recordings and mastering of the sound piece that you hear when you go to the website for the main exhibition. That in itself, it's a lot of conversations around facilitating those relationships, those friendships, setting up the physical space, all the technical aspects of recording music and mastering and finishing that music. I mean, there's just an incredible amount of moving parts to all of this. 
I think this is where collaboration is so strong. I wouldn't have been able to make this piece on my own. There's no way. It wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't have the complexity. It wouldn't have the depth. And so I love that we started initially from a collaborative place with the three of us. We expand that collaboration as often as we can through the framework of the piece to the musicians and the singers and the choirs and also to the people who are contributing their tributary voices. Collaboration allows us to have this complexity and nuance that is just more challenging to do on your own. I think actually the whole notion of producing all of this during the pandemic, it's been a story for a lot of the people we've been talking with over the last year. But a detail I'm sort of curious about is the recordings. Those were done, though, for the physical installations. How did you actually have the musicians do the recordings then? I mean, you weren't in a studio, I presume, together. So how are you doing that? Yeah, we actually did COVID safe studio recordings. So we had initially intended to do them all at KUNM radio station, but the station is, of course, closed. And so we ended up using a couple of spaces at the UNM Arts Lab. And basically what I did is I set up all the gear, got the conductor set up. The conductor is telling you like as the years are passing, it's like a video so that you're in the right place in your score as you're performing. So that all they had to do was like hit play on that and then had them come into the building at a time when there's not anybody there and go into the room on their own and set everything up. So it's kind of like this funny process where before they came, I was testing the gear by running back and forth between two rooms versus the way you would usually do it, which is where you're set up in different rooms and communicating. So it's kind of running back and forth, got everything at good levels. Then they came in, you know, and we're in two different rooms with a piece of glass between us and doing a lot of visual communicating or trying to yell to each other somehow. Or I think a couple of times I like wrote something on a piece of paper and stuck it on the window and just tried to create a COVID safe recording situation using some gear that KUNM lent me from the studio. So we had really nice microphones and everything that we would have. And then just really trying to be mindful of everybody's space, putting a lot of time between the performers, like many days between each session and making sure there's like hand sanitizer and that there's water available for them that I haven't touched with my physical hands, you know, maybe touched with a gloved hand. Like we were really careful. And honestly, it's some of the only live music I saw during the pandemic was watching them record. And it was something that kept me kind of going in some ways, because as we were talking about, we all miss live music so much. So it was nice. And it was for them some of the only performing or music that they've made in this time, right? It was in October, a little bit before the election, actually. That's actually kind of really beautiful. I mean, the idea of these people doing such intimate, important recording work during the pandemic almost makes it more special. I'm also curious, there's been the live performances. Maybe at some point there will be a sound installation at the UNM Art Museum, maybe. But right now the website is the place. I mean, I have to say, having looked at a lot of interactive art, I really like the interface. I like the simplicity of it. I mean, I could put a four-year-old in front of it and they could push buttons and the way the map scrolls. Someone programmed and developed that. Is that one of you three or is there someone who did all that programming for the website for you? We worked with a web development organization based out of Santa Fe called Mindshare Labs. And that was another element of collaboration in which we had extensive design conversations about, well, this is what we want. There's like a few layers about how we were approaching the work because we had already designed the physical space with the physical considerations that were informed by lots of conceptual conversations and relationships and holding space for lots of complexity. And so we already had that. We had already had months of those conversations. And so then it became time to how do we communicate this to this development team who is tasked with the technical aspects of how do you actually build this out? How do we program this to exist in a virtual space? But under the guidelines of all the considerations that we had as far as how we want people to experience it, what was important to us aesthetically, all of those considerations. You did the website since you were making the shift from planning a physical installation. Was there anything that you weren't able to do with the website that you were hoping to do with the physical installation or or vice versa, where going online gave you new opportunities? 
Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if we've really sat down and had specifically that conversation, but I think that was a conversation that unfolded kind of over the course of all of those months. And it was honestly something we talked about all the time, which was what were those core considerations that we had made? What was our initial vision? And that was kind of one of the things that came out of our collaboration was that it was always kind of a constant check-in of what was our initial vision and what are we trying to do? And if we are making a change in something, how is it still able to communicate that initial vision? How do we design it in a way that still has all those attributes and characteristics and experiences that we were initially designed for? But that being said, lots of things changed that wouldn't have been the case otherwise. Like the online contribution forms, being able to host everyone's music contributions as the tributaries kind of on its own separate website, the call-in phone number, you know, how does a website function? How do people use the website? How can we make this work as accessible as possible? I mean, that was one of the things that the website did is that it kind of opened up this conversation of like, well, we can reach a lot more people potentially online than would have been able to make it into the physical space. Also that show as a physical space probably would have lasted a couple of months or something and then would have come down. And now we have this virtual space that in theory can just stay there and continue to be added to. So that's one significant difference is that now it's a space that potentially can continue to evolve well beyond what we imagined it to be. I think as you're talking about it, I forgot how hard that process was. Like I haven't thought in a little while about that rough transition from thinking physical installation versus virtual. What I was afraid would be missing is that we had intended for this to be something that the viewer, the audience experienced in their bodies and physically in space. In the installation, we were planning to use these very directional speakers so that there were moments where you would hear just what one point along the river or there were moments where the whole river would emerge and kind of be part of the experience. So losing the physicality of it is hard when we're talking about the embodiment of the river and hoping that other people can start to feel that embodiment in themselves as they're taking the piece in. But I would say that the surprise was the tributaries kind of do that. When I hear the audio that people have submitted, it's like I can feel them in space. I can feel them standing next to the river or in their backyard or at their house or whatever, like telling me the stories. And I didn't know that that would work out that way. I came into it kind of cold and I was pretty blown away by what I saw. It's I a mean, really powerful work. Dylan, Marisa, Jessica, thank you so much for taking time out of your hyper busy schedules to talk with us about this project. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And if you would like more information about this project or to interact with this project or to contribute a tributary to this project, you can visit the website othernamesfortheriver.com. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum.